To access closed captioning, click on the icon CC Live transcript on the Zoom control panel. If you experience technological difficulties, please go to the technical support guides area above the schedule on the symposium page. We are in a Zoom session, so please keep your video feature off and stay muted to eliminate any potential distractions during the presentation. We would love for you to tweet out or share out on social media all that you are learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag for this symposium is hashtag Patent Literacy 2022. And now we would like to introduce you to our presenter, Robert Meyer. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Karen and Sherry. And thank you, everybody, for attending this session. It's really an honor to be invited to present at Patton. And um, I'm very excited about this topic, and I hope you find this interesting. And I'm just going to um, forge ahead by, you can't see this, I don't think, but there's a disclaimer title at the top. By way of disclaimer, I'm an education publisher. We publish speech language pathology tests and several linguistically responsive teaching resources, including a uh, supplemental program used to teach letter knowledge, but this is not a commercial presentation. I'll describe eight commercial supplemental reading programs later in the presentation that all have embedded pictographs, but that's just part of this. Uh, so the outcomes today, I'm going to present four, really focus on four recent RCT studies on letter learning. And um, I think the findings are really important and they're also surprising, some of them vis-a-vis -vis prevalent ways teachers tend to introduce and teach alphabet knowledge in the United States and then standards and assessments. I'm not gonna read through all these word by word. Um, I'll use just one reading model. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a uh, Zoom. Uh, I, I hope everybody can see the title of this slide. Um, I'm seeing a Zoom. Okay, good. All right. So I'm using Dr. Linnea Aries' orthographic mapping theory just as the only reading model to kind of frame this talk. And this is from a paper that she and Dr. Teresa Roberts had published in 2006. Alphabetic languages are phoneme-based writing systems. Letter knowledge and phoneme segmentation are foundational. So in order to learn to read words using the grapheme phoneme connections, beginners need to first learn the letter shapes, names, and sounds. So this is just basic. And then automaticities in, in these lower level skills is going to provide a platform for the development of automatic word reading. I am having a, there we go. Um, so just a little bit about myself. In the last five years, I've, I've worked in publishing for 25 years. And in the last five years, I gave a lot of conference talks on letter learning uh, because of our company. And I've always tried to make them not commercial. And I like this slide a lot. This used to be up at Reading Rockets, and this is a chart that shows the progression of difficulty and spelling rules, and I think everyone would agree, logically, you have to start somewhere. There's, I don't know if people would dis agree exactly on this chart, but you have to start at the beginning with those shapes and the names and the sounds. And the other point that I like to make with this slide is that it, it seems as though how Educators in the United States introduced these beginning, um, you know, alphabet knowledge elements is driven more by convention than any empirical um, basis. And then during the, uh, and, and I've given probably 30 conference talks, mostly state early childhood literacy and special education conferences, but also some national conferences to include the National Head Start, National Title I, the Nighthouse Conference, NABE, uh, National Black Child Development Institute, International Literacy Association, and um, uh, High Scope International Research. 
And I, in the past two years, had a chance because of COVID to learn a lot more about um, the science of reading, especially primary grades reading. And I gave my first talks to I, IDA state organizations, um, the, I think the Illinois IDA and the Wisconsin IDA. And somehow um, I was invited by Dr. Pam Kastner to present on her open mic night in December. And which was beyond flattering. And because I had given so many of these conference talks, I was just completely flattered and pretty overwhelmed that she invited me because she has national expert people um, on her open mic night. But I also felt as though with my background in the 25 years, and I read, you know, I read all of the Children of the Code interviews when they came out in the 90s. I thought I could, I could do this. And what she invited me to present on was this recent research. So all of this is kind of a preamble to this um, presentation of these studies. And about a year ago, the Reading Research Quarterly published a summary article by Dr. Teresa Roberts. I'm just gonna wave it up here. In which she summarized four recent RCT studies that she had co-authored that were published in 2017, 18, 19, and 20, I think. They were all on letter learning. And this is what I presented on, on Dr. Kastner's open mic night. And these are very technical. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna kind of give you an overview of this article and then go through the studies. And what I thought I would do uh, for the open mic night was first present kind of an overview of the literature of research on letter learning as kind of a build up to these four studies. And what I found was that it was very overwhelming. There's a tremendous amount of research on letter learning. And I, my joke is it's kind of like the Titanic when the iceberg comes into view and you realize, no, you're not going to do a, a review of the literature because you don't have a semester. So I really focused in on these four studies. And Dr. Roberts, who's the same Dr. Roberts who co-authored that, that paper with um, Dr. Linnea Airy, is a top methodologist. And she co-authored these studies with Dr. Patricia Badassi, Dr. Elizabeth Sanders, and then one of them was with Dr. The fourth one was just with Dr. Carol Sadler. These were all randomized controlled trial studies that aligned cognitive and instructional science. They were all done with preschool age children, all low SES students. They had a, about a fourth of the students were three-year-olds, but they were mostly four-year-olds. And they deliberately included almost a, or a little more than a third dual language learners or English learners. And so, this was really interesting because this is a population of children typically served by Head Start funded preschool. The, the experimental conditions were highly, highly, highly controlled. The, they discluded students who knew more than a few letter names. So they were really looking at um, instructional approaches and all the different elements that they studied with students who were coming in cold, who didn't know anything. And the, um, like I mentioned, the uh, instructional conditions were um, highly controlled and highly consistent. So each of the four years, this instruction started at the beginning of the year. The lessons were taught by research assistants over a 10 or 12 week period. The children were randomly assigned to small group instruction. The um, research assistants taught the same subset of letters. They didn't go through the whole alphabet. And this is um, a chart in this over, over um, in this reading research quarterly summary article. And prior to the studies, the authors did a review of the literature and they only looked at high quality design studies. And there's a dearth of high quality design studies. There's a, 
there's an ocean of studies, but the high quality design studies, there really haven't been that many. And this is a chart summarizing the studies. I won't read through the chart. But what they found and reported in the summary article is that there were some really big missing gaps in letter learning instruction in the literature coming out of randomized control studies, uh, um, quasi-experimental design studies. And so no study systematically compared the order of teaching letter names or letter sounds. That's a pretty big deal. I mean, if you think about designing something from scratch, most studies had not been informed by the orthographic depth, the complexity, predictability of grapheme, phoneme, correspondences, the GPCs. The rate of introducing letters and the size of letter units taught. You know, usually people are teaching one letter at a time. Traditionally, educators taught one letter a week. Oftentimes, I think a lot of people have moved on from that. But this suggests re-examining how GPCs are taught, and especially so for children who tend to become underserved in literacy. I mean, these are researchers who are really digging into the literature. Almost no research exists on which alphabet content should be taught during preschool. The conceptual frameworks for how children learn missing from the studies. And then investigations into motivation and engagement missing. So very few studies, finally, disaggregated findings for dual language learners. And if you consider the demographic changes in the United States, that's a big deal too. So five key questions that they developed from their review. This is all kind of the backdrop drop before they get started. And these questions didn't inform, they didn't, I don't think set out to do four studies. I think they did the first one and then that kind of um, led to how they thought about doing another one and then another one and then another one. But these five questions kind of informed them throughout the whole process. So which alphabet content is going to optimize learning? The names, the sounds, or both? Do you teach the letter names before the sounds or vice versa? And I've not been preoccupied with this, but that's been kind of a thought to me. The first book I ever read in about reading when I got into publishing 25 years ago, I just accidentally found the book was Diane McGinnis's Why Our Children Can't Read and What We Can Do About It. And I still have that book and it's just filled with post-it notes. And I don't know why I became so fascinated by that book. I wasn't working for a company that was involved in primary grades reading, but letter names before sounds, um, which cognitive learning processes will optimize learning? And that's a fancy term for um, just kind of a pedagogical approach. So paired associated learning, which is explicit direct instruction here, where you just, I, you probably won't be able to see this, where you show a letter and you teach the letter name or the sound. And then articulation referencing would be where you're teaching the, the, the letter knowledge, but also explaining and modeling maybe with uh, graphic cards or mirrors, what you're doing with your mouth as you're producing a sound. And then orthographic learning would be teaching the alphabet knowledge and at the same time you're showing how you're forming um, the letters. So they're gonna look at these different things, these different cognitive learning approaches. And then it's teaching letters in the context of meaningful language advantageous. And then finally, can alphabet instruction be designed to promote learning and motivation and so in this summary article, and if you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend finding that article. And just as an aside, I thought that the Reading Research Quarterly two-part special edition on the science of reading, which was wonderful. And that's where this was published. And I especially thought the way that the editors defined the science of reading was important. It's like the science of agriculture or the science of astronomy, or the science of medicine. It's the whole literature, worldwide, cradle to grade. It isn't just primary grades reading. So the science of reading is the whole gamut. And um, so anyway, here's, I'm not gonna read through all this, 
but you can see how this is the experiment one and two, and the next slide is three and four. And what they've done is that they've organized all of the experimental small group conditions so in such a to such a degree that every one of them can serve as a control for all of the others. So this is a super experiment. And I've written four small business innovation IES grant proposals in collaboration with reading researchers to fund R&D on new early language and literacy tests. Every time you do that, it ruins your winter break and you get a whole new stack of papers. I have stacks and stacks and stacks of research papers. And I joked with Dr. Roberts later, I was pretty badly outmatched by this because they've asked so many questions. This is so highly controlled. But what they've done is that they've created um, um, a, 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 a combination of experiments that are going to really uh, produce findings that can be highly informative. And so I feel like I'm talking out at everybody. And uh, I've, I've gotten to give this presentation several more times since I first gave it at Dr. Kastner's open mic night. I presented uh, virtually to Nabe and to an early childhood conference, but I also got to give this talk at the Wisconsin State Reading Association in January, which was incredibly fun because I had an audience. We do some activities and things to make it engaging, but we, I also got to hear their questions and to engage in conversation about this. And um, that was fun. I would love to be able to do that with you now, but I can't. So all of every, everything I've talked about so far and shown you is kind of a preamble to this. And what this is, is the next four slides, which will summarize each of the four studies. And I'm going to describe the key findings and do my best to describe the studies. And then once we're done with through those, let's take a short pause. And if you have any questions you want to write into the chat, then I can answer those and do my best to answer those because you won't have to hold them all the way to the end. But let me go through these next four uh, slides, one per study. And just as an aside, usually at an RCT, a randomized control trial, researchers are really focusing in on one or two questions because they want to be able to report with the greatest confidence that they can the answer to the question. Not so with these researchers. I had to laugh when I first started to read these. I, 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 several weeks before I presented um, the first time, I thought, I'll read one study each night and then go through them the first time and I started to read I read through this first study and I just had to laugh because it's so dense with so many questions so in this first study they really look at content they look at three content treatments letter names ln letter sounds letter names and sounds and then one business as usual which is a letter names and sounds heavily contextualized in children's names poems alphabet books and things like that. They also created a model of engagement that I'm not really going to talk about too much because um, it was a separate model from how they investigated motivation. They were very concerned that anything that they did would be demotivating to children because young children, it, it can't be overly academic. So they find eight large effects providing empirical evidence related to the research questions for content taught. They find nuanced, complex pattern of effects. No clear, simple answer as to the best content approach. Learning sounds, letter sounds, is not dependent on first knowing the letter names. This took me a long time to kind of process because there's so much evidence on the catalyzation effect. So letter names can provide a bridge to the learning of sounds. So if a, a little boy's name is Bill and the child learns Bill is spelled B-I-L-L. -L. B is the first letter of, a child, of the child's name. And B is the letter name. And the letter name starts with the B sound. So that's a bridge. 
it exists, it, it's useful, um, but it took me a while to figure out, do, does this study contradict that? No, it doesn't. And the reason it, one reason it doesn't is because the children came in knowing nothing. It, this is a group that doesn't know any names or sounds. And it also, um, just because the catalyzation effect exists doesn't mean that you have to know the letter name before you can learn the sound. And that's what they're reporting causally from this highly controlled experiment. Finding the letter name and letter sound experimental condition led to the greatest growth in names and sounds like you would imagine. The letter name group learned the most names. The letter sound group learned the most sounds. They were very surprised that young children could learn both together. They thought it would be too much information. There was no effect teaching names before sounds or vice versa, but teaching the sounds first produced the greater letter sound learning in the group that had the most PAL instruction. They also were testing these cognitive learning processes. An important finding also was every experimental condition worked. Children learned alphabet knowledge regardless of how they were taught, but some of the experimental conditions produce statistically significantly better letter learning. Also throughout all four studies, there were always some students who didn't learn very much and who struggled. And what the researchers theorized is that this is because letter learning is hard and especially sounds. So that's the first study and it was a full meal. And then the second study, here's where they really look at the cognitive learning processes, the three different generic approaches and uh, finding the explicit PAL instruction, which is a memory versus a meaning mediated task in the simplest to teach produced superior outcomes to the other two groups for letter name and letter sound learning, except for the dual language learners. Again, they, they also tested letter order. There was no influence. And they find and report that learning letter sounds was not dependent on first learning the names. In fact, teaching sounds first might be the most advantageous and especially uh, with the most PAL instruction. And they find importantly that preschool age DLLs, including children living in poverty can learn challenging content when the instruction is explicit. One of the really biggest contributions to the literature that they're making here is they're setting the stage for future research on the dual language learners. So in the next, um, the third study, they look at contextualization. And to me, this is a really important study because contextualized learning is really the predominant way that the preschool curriculums are delivering alphabet lessons. So they compare contextualizing letters embedded in storybook reading and students' names and in words with uh, the letter, they compare the contextualized with uh, PAL on letter name sound learning and engagement. Both conditions worked again, but the letter sound outcomes were superior for the decontextualized group especially for the, English, the dual language learners, English learners. They used measures of um, letter name and letter sound learning. They used a measure of phonemic awareness, the uh, identifying the beginning sound in the first letter in words. And they had measures of, of a measure of retrieval speed. They also had activities to build retrieval long-term memory. They assessed engagement three times during the experiment with a model that they created. And again, they find support for explicit letter instruction. And they found that in all four studies. So finally, the fourth study, they look at embedded pictograph mnemonics and they compare that with teaching letters and alphabet books. So both conditions are designed to provide situational interest as to boost student motivation along with letter sound learning. One more time, they find there's no demotivating consequences of explicit academically focused PAL letter sound instruction, but they find evidence for the superiority of the embedded pictographs 
in teaching the sounds, blending, and the phonemic awareness measure, the children learn twice as much with the embedded pictographs, which they have a huge effect. So that was a lot of summary information. I can tell you this, uh, I was so nervous about my initial presentation because there was so much information that came out of this. I was so gratified to know from the author, two of the authors afterwards that they thought I did a good job of reporting this out and that, that I didn't make any big mistakes because every time you do this and you look at all of these findings, um, you think, you really ponder a lot and you think, wow, and you have to kind of let it set in and you think and you, and it would be very easy to say the wrong thing or to uh, confuse somebody. But I think having gone out and presented 35 times and really learned a lot about alphabet learning, I think that these studies make an enormous contribution to the literature. They isolate a large number of variables in these highly controlled experiments such that they can make causal interpretations about content, procedures, learning activities, contextualization, and just consider the, the and we're going to talk about this in the next part of the presentation, consider the conventional ways people teach letter learning. There's all this evidence for the value of explicit PAL, nine variations across studies, they disaggregate outcomes for the DLLs, English learners, English speakers. And then there's the um, embedded pictographs. And Karen, maybe this is a good time. Uh, it looks, I can see that in the chat where you're getting questions. Yes. Um, so I have gotten a couple questions, possibly Sherry has, and possibly Robert, that you also might have gotten a couple questions. But I'll start off with this. Um, so could you just give us a little bit of background about what PAL instruction is, um, paired associative learning? Yes. Uh, when we learn, when the brain is being wired to become a reader, we're learning to associate these squiggly shapes. I could hold, I just drew a letter D. I don't know if you can see it, or maybe that looks like a B to you. But we learn these squiggly, to recognize these squiggly shapes and associate the letter names and the beginning sound. That's where it starts. So B has a letter name B and the beginning sound is B. And in this paired associated learning, so we're making an association in the brain and Dr. Roberts et al. described the paired associated learning with showing letters and teaching the children this is the letter D, the name is D, and, and depending on the treatment condition, the beginning sound is D. And to do that with the letters they were teaching. So it's just that simple. So associating the letters with the sounds, is that correct? Or the names, or both, depending on the condition. Okay, thank you. And this might be a vocabulary term. Can you please explain the term embedded pictographs? I'm going to show those in the next section of the okay. presentation. Awesome. Thank you. And then I'm not sure if you'll be getting into implications for instruction as well, but curious about letter teaching to English language learners who have not had the opportunity to learn to read in any language and begin school in grades third and up. Do you know of any studies that look at this? I don't. And I have to admit, I, that's probably my weakest area background. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. And I would, but I would recommend, um, well, I'd be glad to try to find uh, some resources for that. Thank you, Robert. Um, I don't think my colleague Sherry has any questions that came directly to her. Um, are you able just to check the chat to see if there's anything in, in yours? No, I don't have any questions at this time, Karen. Thank you, Sherry. I'm kind of afraid to because not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. We're doing so I think that's all the questions so well. we have for now. And then we'll wait for the QA or another time for any additional questions. Okay, when we get when we get to the end, then we can open it up to questions. So That'd be great. Thank you for those questions. So now the next section of this will be the embedded pictographs. And this, you know, to be honest, 
I was initially interested in this because of embedded pictographs, because I, because of my background, I believe that they're of value and of use. So, but what I found from doing this is that there's so much more going on than embedded pictographs. So, um, Back to the Reading Research Quarterly special edition on the science of reading. In 2020, Dr. Linnea Airy had an article published in which she reintroduces this, this uh, model, letter knowledge and phonemic segmentation are central. Beginners need to learn letter shapes, names, and sounds. And this involves forming associations between the shapes and the sounds. Alphabet posters typically display letters with a picture whose name begins with the sound, but whose shape is unrelated to the letter. And then embedded pictographs have a shape that's related to the letter superimposed. And what she's uh, post, you know, what she's um, arguing or presenting is that the pictured object helps to secure association in memory. So mnemonics, it's a generic term, goes back centuries. But the pictograph, it's just a, a, some type of a visual device that helps to secure an association in memory. And again, that's what le letter learning is, it involves. So here's a typical alphabet chart. I think of these as anchor pictures. You might call them other things. But the Z, zebra starts with the letter Z. The beginning sound is Z, but it's not shaped like a Z. And I'll just give you a second to look at the different examples. House doesn't look like an H. The balloon doesn't look like a, the letter B. This is um, a collection of uh, graphical images from the eight commercial supplemental reading programs that I'm aware of that use embedded pictographs. So you can see Annie Apple down in the lower right. The apple is shaped it's a round shape. It's superimposed on the lower case A. Uh, these are all different uh, programs. Zoophonics is a very comprehensive supplemental pre-K-5 program. Some of these are, um, the one we publish is, uh, has a much, much, much smaller um, scope as some of these other ones do too. And some of these are digital and other ones aren't. So, that's really the difference. And I looked for research studies that involve programs that have embedded pictographs. And there's actually quite a few. And they all seem to report positive findings. The one in purple, and I have two pages of these. And the one in purple, Dr. Airy and other authors in 1984, a very tiny scale study reported big effects for embedded pictographs. The children learned twice as much letter knowledge with embedded pictographs. So that would be consistent with the findings from the study that I just described a few minutes ago. You know, there's a lot of focus on high quality design studies and RCTs, but I think other studies can provide a lot of useful information as well. For example, the Griffith study, the efficacy of the zoophonics program, six studies. This is a summary article describing six studies involving preschool age children. And in all of their studies, all, almost all of the preschool children learned um, all of the letter names and the beginning sounds, which is way more than I think what we know children in Head Start are learning. There's two summary or review studies that I'm not citing because I couldn't find them. But uh, researchers at different times reported that children were coming out of Head Start funded preschool knowing five or six letter names. And that's not very much alphabet knowledge. It, but from some of these studies that aren't high quality design studies, we there's evidence that children can learn way more alphabet knowledge. And I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. The two blue studies, the ones shown in blue, are studies that were done on our program 
And uh, the children went all the way through the all 26 letters and they learned a lot more uh, knowledge as well. So those are examples. And then the two purple ones down here, the one I rep I've already described, and then Dr. Airy again in 2010, Hebrew letters, the children learned twice as much. So there's some really big effects that are consistent. So I think there's a pretty strong growing evidence for embedded pictographs. They're, these aren't large scale studies. So the next obvious thing might be to scale that up and do more research with that. Now, by way of disclaimer, this is ours. Um, the way that these all kind of work is that there's a um, there's these pictographs, there's little short narrative stories. This is a cat catching a mouse. The cat's mouth is open wide. The mouse is not inside. And there's an alliteration. And um, children learn these pictograph stories and they're taught the phonemes. So, uh, which is impossible to say without even, without a little bit of a sound, you know, a vowel sound, the ah, octopus, dog. Duh. So we, after children learn the pictographs and they are being taught the phonemes, then they're, they, um, we wean the children off to where they are, they're blending with letters. And our late program author, who I wanna credit, developed this for a, a little boy who had been retained in kindergarten for a year. He couldn't remember a single sound symbol correspondence and she really believed that the integrated motor movement helped connect this, the dots for him in his brain the, so he could associate the sound symbol correspondence, which he did, and then he ended up going to college. And there's um, support for integrated uh, motor movement. The, uh, I can't pronounce this, but the second bullet point, there's a study reporting that associating letter formations and sounds develops brain connections that support later reading. And that would seem to be um, heavy. And you know, the places in the brain that fire together, wire together. The, uh, there's evidence, and I should have some citations here, pre-K students' ability to write letters is associated with alphabet knowledge and phonemic awareness. Uh, we know that letter writing is typically not incorporated with the letter sound instruction in the preschool curriculums. I think that's one reason why we have these um, big supplemental handwriting uh, publishers. There are few of any studies of, on the consequences of teaching capital or lowercase letter formations first. I think that's a really big point. But Kind of this section on embedded pictographs is that they don't just help secure, I mean, in theory, they're not just helping secure the association between the sound and the symbol, but they can help facilitate the formation of that lowercase letter movement. And that that might be helping to establish the basis for what's going to become the orthographic mapping reading. So that's kind of a, the or that's kind of the embedded uh, pictograph uh, section. So I tried to think of a, a good thing to say to transition to this next point that I want to make, but I couldn't, so I'm just going to lurch into it. Uh, when we think about the, this science of letter learning that's emerging and standards, there's a very interesting and an important study that was done, the benchmark study in 2012. And researchers looked at different states, which all had their own benchmarks for how many letter names should children learn in preschool. And Head Start, I think at the time, advocated 10, and it kind of ranged from 10 to 20. And so researchers looked at, uh, they did a big study uh, capturing how many letter names children were learning coming out of preschool, and they followed the students to the end of first grade, and, they, and using a very sophisticated psychometric model, they established a, a risk model that predicted the risk of uh, reading difficulty, and they came up with a benchmark of 18 uppercase and 15 lowercase letter names. So if children didn't come out of preschool or appear in kindergarten, um, knowing at least this much alphabet knowledge, that was a 
that was a, a flag. That was a predict, that would be a risk predictor. And this is a really important study because it provides kind of a um, important frame of reference. And this informed the current federal Head Start uh, standards, and which describe a developmental progression and then indicators by five years, 60 months, there's the 18 uppercase, 15 lowercase letter names. Based on what we know from the latest science of letter learning, it's kind of interesting to think, is this really a developmental progression or is it also a conventional progression? Because in preschool, so much focus and attention is given to teaching the letter names. How many sounds are the children learning? Beginning sounds, because that's, knows the sounds associated with several letters. We see this reflected in the kindergarten readiness assessments. So here's PALS 4K, students are asked to name the uppercase letters. If they know 16 or more, then they can proceed to the lowercase letters. And then those who know nine or more then are asked about for, to produce the beginning sounds for letters. So this is interesting vis-a-vis -vis this latest science because when we begin to read, we need to know the letter names, but we read, we don't read with the letter names, we read with the beginning sounds at first. We start blending those sounds, the heck, and so on. So 30 years ago, before I got into publishing, I worked in engineering and I worked in a big environmental engineering company in New Jersey. And it was a big publicly traded company and it was so much fun. We had lunch every day in a big cafeteria with big cafeteria tables. And everybody, the salespeople, the marketing people, the executives sat down at uh, lunch with the engineers and it was learn at lunch. You might sit down at a table with engineers who were cleaning up the Boston Harbor or uh, wastewater experts or um, trash to cash engineers. Uh, you know, working on uh, pollution control or uh, super fun cleanup people. And they were highly, highly, highly empirical. And they would ask us questions like, well, why are you trying to solve that marketing problem in that particular way? And if you said, I, I don't know, it's, I guess it's how we've always done it. Someone might spit out their food. You know, doing something the way you've always done it isn't a supportable way to do anything. That's the opportunity to reconsider how you might look at a problem or to think about an assumption or to think about conditions that might change such that your assumptions become invalid or think about the latest science in one of the disciplines in your field and how that might make it possible to design a completely new thing. And so considering how, considering the inertia of the conventions of letter learning and I'm kind of thinking about the uh, predominant preschool curriculum publishers and the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the way that um, most letter learning is contextualized in stories and things like that and which content is taught. If we gave this research to, the, to those engineers and if we could give them the reading models they wouldn't be able to assimilate it fast enough. But if you just imagine that they could, and we could give them all of this information about letter learning and say, design the next generation alphabet knowledge supplemental curriculum, what would they design? And they would ask all the questions in the world that would be irritating. They would wanna know which content would you teach over the course of the preschool year? If you have 10 or 15 minutes a day, and that's what the researchers were uh, delivering their lessons with, by the way. And I think that's what most preschool teachers are doing, 10, 12, 15 minutes a day. The engineers would wanna know, does that amount of time increase during the year as children are becoming developmentally older? Um, can you teach all of this content during the year? And why would you do that? What's the scope and sequence? You teach the names of the sounds first. What's the order? What's the rate? What's, do you teach one letter at a time? You know, they'd look at every possible, um, possi every possible uh, element of this. What's the best combination of the instructional elements, the CLPs, 
And then what would be the purpose? And I would argue the purpose would be to optimize early reading development. And I've come up with an acronym. I call it CLIP. It has a silent W. It's a little silly, but I think it's important because, so it stands for which content, the scope and sequence, the instructional elements, the CLPs. Because when you buy a product, you're, the product conveys content and method. And when you hear people say, you know, we're a, I'll use the word Acme, you know, if, if Houghton Mifflin or a Scholastic, you know, you think of a company and they'll say, well, we're an Acme district. We use Acme. Um, when you use a product, that's conveying the C clip. And so anyway, let's say we ask the engineers to do this. They've done this whole review. They want to know about all the research. Now they're going to design this new alphabet supplemental curriculum. They've taken that, um, that chart. They've laid it on its side. They're looking here at, this is preschool. Now it's complicated because not everyone gets to go to preschool. So this preschool letter learning, which the way I think about it is what, what preschools could learn, the letter knowledge over the course of, of the preschool year, probably uh, kindergartners can learn during the fall, roughly, which alphabet content. And to me, what I've become so convinced about is which alphabet content is going to help optimize beginning reading development. And so the engineers want to build something that's really fantastic. It has to work better than anything's ever worked before. It has to be elegant. Here's my metaphor for what they would build. It's just a metaphor. It's not perfect, but this is the tallest bridge in the world. It was only possible to design this because of all the latest science in material science, I mean, the you know, research in material science, dynamics, everything. And the metaphor is, reading development, how far can the students go? Um, this is the road to orthographic mapping. And then this is based on the latest science about how children learn and what they can learn, how fast they can learn. And in contrast, what are, what's the state of the state? In most of the class, preschool classrooms in America, because of the programs they're using, which content are you using their C clip? What does their bridge look like? I would argue it looks like more like this. This is the longest covered bridge in the world. It's a bridge. Um, the metaphor is that the children don't go as far in their beginning reading development. Now, why is this important? I think this is why this is important. This is the NAEP, the green chart at the top is the NAEP fourth grade over the last 30 years. And you can see the last 15 years, and this is before COVID, about one third of all children were at below basic in the 15 years before COVID. That didn't improve. There's a lot of focus today about how important it is that all children become proficient. I think that's an ideal. Real life, environmental circumstances, language variation, English learners. Realistically, I think the goal should be that we should have almost nobody at below basic based on what we know about reading from all of the science. And then the bottom here is the broad federal racial categories, Black American children, Hispanic American, Native American. It's more than one half. That's before COVID. And it's probably you know way worse now. But over that time, if the letter learning could have become refined based in the science, is the potential there to help preempt some of this below basic reading? I really believe that. We don't know empirically, but I think that it, it should be possible. Now, this slide came out of the um, I believe this is from the Illinois IDA. They created this last year. How many children are capable innately of becoming proficient readers? And what they're arguing is that only 5% are, 
of all students are going to really struggle to become proficient in reading. So um, let me go back. One third at below basic. If you're below basic at fourth grade, it's a disaster. You've spent half your life learning. You can't do school. You can't. How does the teacher differentiate instruction? And if you're at basic level reading at fourth grade, it's not ideal, but it's way, way, way better than below basic. And I'm not arguing we want children at basic in reading. We just, it's a disaster to have children, all these children at below basic. So if every student is capable of learning all of the lowercase letter names and all of the beginning sounds, in preschool. And I don't know what the optimal content is, but we know with some programs, children spend a lot of time in the fall forming capital letters. Is that contributing in an optimal way to reading development? I don't know, but I don't believe that that's the case. But if all children could learn all of the lowercase letter names in the beginning sounds and start doing some letter formation in a way that positively contributed to reading development, then who wouldn't be able to do it? It would be children who, and I'm, this is a slide from Dr. Tiffany Hogan's wonderful uh, National Reading League presentation two years ago in which she did, uh, presented dyslexia DLD as co-occurring and then sometimes not co-occurring and how important it is to identify children very early on as possible who might have one of these issues, a uh, risk of dyslexia, um, reading deficits, I think one third of all children who have, who present DLD aren't identified in time to receive SOP services in kindergarten. And then that's gonna present as reading difficulties. So if we could refine alphabet instruction in the United States, wouldn't we be helping in the early identification at the same time? So I'm gonna start wrapping up. I'm checking my time, I'm good. Um, alphabet learning has, and this is one of the big takeaways to me from this letter learning science. It's always been considered a low level skill. It's probably been overlooked from a science of reading perspective. And in the summary article, Dr. Roberts talks a lot about how this is letter learning from a science of reading standpoint, because they really investigated in the most scientific way possible all these different instructional elements. And that it's long been believed to be something that children can accomplish easily and formally and naturally. And it's taught in meaningful contexts with a focus on language and an aversion to academic learning. 72% um, of the Head Start funded preschools use a whole child curriculum and we know that they're, they predominate. And that the difficulty of letter learning has been so underappreciated that limited attention has been given to the very pace of the instruction and the content, which couldn't be more elemental. It's the, what are we teaching and then how fast are we going are just two of the really big dimensions. So 25 years ago, when I got into publishing, I didn't just somehow trip over the Diane McGinnis book. I also accidentally discovered um, uh, the book Left Back by Diane Ravitch at a, I think it was at a bookstore. I mean, at a, a book, I can't remember where I found it. And then I was at, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, I'd gone to work for Advantage Learning Systems and I had a music education background. I had never taught reading. And I saw this book, The Schools We Need by E.D. Hirsch and Why We Don't Have Them. And I bought it. And I, showed it to Terry Paul, the uh, late co-founder of Advantage Learning Systems. And he came back to my cubicle a week later. He went and bought it too. He said, call E.D. Hirsch because we're going. And I did and we did. And I met Dr. Hirsch. And in this wonderful book, at the end, he argued only an informed public will be able to forcefully convince the education thought world, as he described it, to move on from these failed psychological theories about how children learn. And these theories that had emanated from teachers college 75 years ago, now it's been a whole century. And it's interesting, we're saying we're up to 22 states who have enacted legislation um, 
forcing educate their state education systems to move on from queuing instruction and balance literary, the use of public funds and all that. So it's interesting, those aren't forcible convincings. Those are forcings. And when I tell people who I know what I do and to try to describe what's going on with the, uh, you know, these reading legislative, they, they can't believe it. Why wouldn't we want research to practice? Why wouldn't we want the evidence to inform instruction, especially given just how, um, how much of a disaster it is when one third of all children in the United States are below basic in reading. Um, it's a civic disaster, it's an economic disaster and all. Now, this is an important point to acknowledge. Preschool can't become overly academic. If you didn't see this movie, I highly recommend it. But I had to kind of laugh looking at some of the language in these studies that would be so anathema to the constructivistic minded um, thinking that is prevalent. Well, it's prevalent in preschool um, administrators. And another, demand, another cause of the inertia is teacher attitudes. Dr. Laura Skibby, Lori Skibby and others um, did a piggyback study a few years ago in which they, uh, they queried preschool teachers and um, what they believed about letter learning. And um, that corresponds to the prevalent practices, constructivistic based practices. But just look at some of these. I had a lot. Retrieval activities that promote memory, teacher led testing letter specific tasks. And yet look at what came out of these four studies, no demotivating effects whatsoever. So implications for future research, C-clip replication, the C-clips with the big, you know, the elements of the C-clip, they had the big effect sizes, replicate with teachers, replicate, you know, with the whole alphabet, uh, additional studies with the English learners whose growth was consistent with the English learners, except for the learning, that's the letter sounds in the very first study. They've provided such a wonderful uh, framework for to inform what studies would make sense to go forward. How best to introduce writing? Capital versus lowercase letters both. Now I'm biased, but I wonder why it makes sense to spend so much time on capital letters you know, we, we, we know there's been a lot of uh, um, discussion in the uh, phonological sensitivity domain about how much time do you spend on what? That's more than a fair question to ask in any field, medicine, engineering, science, just think in athletic training. We have to be able to ask that in such, you know, these are the two foundational pillars, phoneme proficiency, letter sound proficiency. So I think we need large scale longitudinal multi-year design studies relating proximal alphabet learning outcomes with distal reading measures. Um, and then again, what's that best use of instructional time? I believe that there isn't just one optimal letter learning C-clip, there could be different ones, but unfortunately, most of the students in the United States are you know, getting this, um, the covered bridge one, I'm almost to the end here. There's other emerging, there's other recent studies that are adding to this better, more complete understanding of letter learning too. Uh, Dr. Badassi and Dr. Sanders did a, a, a rate in complexity of GPCs in kindergarten. I think there's a lot of, that's, when you look at some of the new generation core reading programs, how fast are they going in the fall of kindergarten? I don't know how consistent that is with the science. Uh, statistical learning. There's a couple studies I've learned of. Um, the one at the bottom, um, I think is really exciting. Researchers have established a framework with which growth in letter learning can be studied now in preschool. So this is my last slide. Um, conclusions, discussion. I believe completely preschool age children are capable of learning way more alphabet knowledge than the benchmark minimum. That's a minimum, that's a flag. Is, um, 
Is the ACME CCLIP out there optimizing reading development? I don't think so. I think the positive way to put that is there's so much room to improve in reading outcomes, especially for the children who tend to become so underserved in literacy. The, the, the PAL instruction, the, um, the, the findings, I think, um, very contrary to the, um, the most prevalent conventions and how alphabet knowledge is taught. Practitioners, policymakers, Head Start administrators and research funders. One of the re prominent researchers said, you know, it's hard to get funding for alphabet uh, studies because the funders think it's just, it's just the alphabet. So it really, this is such an important contribution. I think Dr. Roberts made a huge contribution by taking the additional time to write that summary paper. The, the researchers were afraid that this knowledge wasn't going to find its way into the practitioner world. And thanks to Dr. Roberts, um, she helped to promote this. And I think it has so much potential. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to questions. And uh, thank you again so much for the opportunity to present this. Thank you, Mr. Myers. We really appreciate all of this overview. We do have